Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. My guest today is Christopher Noel, who holds a master's degree from Yale University and a master's in fine arts from Vermont College of Fine Arts, where he taught writing for 20 years. He also explores and researches the phenomenon of Sasquatch. He is author of many books, including in the unlikely event of water landing, a geography of grief, Sasquatch and autism, 12 parallels, mind speak, tapping into Sasquatch and science, and there is no veil at vast play in the here and now, which is the topic of our conversation today. Chris is located in Montpelier, Vermont. Now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Chris. It's such a pleasure to have you with us on New Thinking Aloud today. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I've uh, followed your channel for years, and so it's a privilege and an honor to be here. The veil is sometimes referred to as a thin boundary between this life and an afterlife, yet you suggest that there is no veil. Yeah, I think that there there is often um, the experience of a veil, uh, which is a subjective experience. You know, We've heard of people who, since childhood, are able to see spirits. And I had an experience in my childhood, my late teens, where I felt a spirit touching my head in the context of a long conversation that a friend and I had with the ghosts. So I knew from back then that this veil is a mirage, in a sense, and that most of the time, for most people, there seems to be one. But um, in fact, it's, it's not an objective and necessary fact that there is this veil. And so many of the paranormal or parapsychological um, breakthroughs and phenomena that people have studied for centuries and, and going back farther than that have proved that it, it can be um, done away with. So therefore, it depends on the situation and on the mindset and the ideology of the people experiencing this, whether there actually does seem to be a veil. So I think it's important. I think that it's my, my um, pet hypothesis is that all of spirit matter and ordinary matter is taking up the same place. And that to, uh, to postulate this sort of barrier is a way of alienating us from that fact and sort of insidiously causing there to be more distance, more otherness than, in fact, is, is the reality of the situation. Can you share a little bit more about your own spirit contact or the ghost story that you refer to in your book? Yeah, when I was 17, uh, an older friend and I um, began com conversing through the Ouija board and also through automatic writing with a spirit uh, who was named John Waite. And she had ex experienced um, balls of light coming down over her while she was in bed at night and a, a, a column of, of light in the corner of the old part of the house that didn't really look like anything when you looked at it in the moment. But then when you thought back on it, everybody who saw it had the same image of a stooped over sad man in overalls. Um, and so I said, being a a, a perky and adventurous 17-year-old, uh, hey, let's try to contact him. And so she luckily was up for it, and we got a Ouija board and then unfolded three months of extensive back and forth with him, which is a, is a really rich experience, a lot of texture, a lot of, a lot of um, tangents and fascinating um, information that he imparted to us. But to boil it down, he had been uh, chained to the earth when he died because he was saturated with remorse because he had killed his daughter. And he wanted us to dig her up. He, in various different framings, it was to go dig up our harvest of bones, as he called it, where she was buried on the property, and also to... Um, um, 
allow him some sort of redemption by loving each other. He said, Kate and Chris must love each other, bear her again, and her is his daughter. And so he wanted us to get together, produce another girl child that could somehow <laughs> replace his murdered daughter and allow him indirectly that way to atone for what he had done. And we said, well, we don't really like each other that way. And <laughs> we never did go check for the bones. And um, we talked to and he got increasingly um, enraged at us for not helping him to move on. Um, you know, but there was a lot, a lot there. And at one point, at, at one point, I felt a hand brush the back, the side and the back of my, of my head. And it felt like it was about one third solid. And that kind of enters into my current hypothesis, which we'll talk about later. But um, also, we would often feel a cold breeze and a piercing cold in the room. Um, and also, we would hear a bell ringing outside the, uh, the, the wall, uh, on the outside of the wall, when in fact there was no physical, ordinary physical bell there. Um, it would signal to us that he was present and ready to talk to us. And you can even hear that bell on the cassette recorder that we used to to speak the letters that the Ouija board was coming up with um, so that we could transcribe them later. So that bell was physically making, uh, you know, um, vibrations in the air coming, coming to our ears. It wasn't some hallucinatory thing. Anyway, so that was a million years ago, um, and I always had this larger reality frame in my mind, thanks to that experience, and always through everything else I've done in my life, I wanted to circle back and try to explore more fully what this larger reality frame might consist of and how it is that I could feel this dead person, actually feel, and we could record the bell of this dead person and feel the cold and so the the current book is my effort to begin to come to terms with the meaning of that experience. Did you ever find out why he murdered his own daughter? Whenever we would ask him about that, he would the letters would become garbled except for one time and he said she would not love me enough. Mm. Which is very chilling, of course. You know, it conjures up all sorts of evil in one's mind, but um his wife had died in childbirth giving birth to this daughter. So that even enriches and gives extra wrinkles to the uh, implications you can have for that phrase, she would not love me enough. Um, but otherwise, he would always sidestep the issue. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that's all That's all we know. Except for years later, we, we didn't at the time go and check the town records because it just felt like the, the experience was so real that we didn't want to be like journalistic about it. We wanted to just have the palpable um, impact of it. But many years later, like 15 years, we were chatting with the town historian and we said, who did not believe in ghosts at all. And she was making fun of us. And she said, well, what house did this happen in? And we told her and she said, oh, the, the old Wait place, W-A-I-T-E. And that was his last name that he had told us 15 years earlier. So that was enough confirmation for, for us. Yeah, that is uh, truly astounding. You also sadly lost your own fiancé to an automobile accident. Has that also been a part of what's led you to explore these phenomena? Yeah, uh, about nine years after that ghost experience, I was had been with um, a woman, my soulmate, for six years when she was suddenly killed in a car accident near our house. And um, this was, needless to say, many people have been through a, a, a variety, a species of that experience. And so you'll understand it completely derailed my life. And of course, it, it helped me to wonder what's, you know, what's the situation? Basically, what's up with all this? Um, I remember that very night when she died, I was standing at the window looking out at the moon. And I said to my sister, I just don't know where she is. And so that's been at the back of my mind, though I never had communication um, that I was aware of with her. So that didn't exactly feed in in any evidential way to what I've been up to lately. And you suggest that there is no hierarchy between heaven and earth. 
I mean, this is all part of the same kind of um, fixed idea of the intrinsic separation uh, between dimensions, whereas I think that they're integrated. And many people have uh, proposed a, a sort of a, a version of that same statement, but um, I'll go into a little more detail as, as we go along about why I think I might have a little bit of a fresh angle on this. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, back in the day, in, in ancient times and up through the Middle Ages, there was this sense of the, the quintessence, the, uh, the spheres, the heavenly sphere versus the earthly sphere. And the earthly um, sphere could not access the heavenly sphere, though the heavenly sphere could occasionally make incursions and influence the earthly sphere. But the, there was this, you know, inherent... Um, distinction in, in a qualitative distinction. Um, and there was this gulf between realms that we, we poor mortals could not hope to understand or, um, cross. And, you know, then increasingly over the, over the millennia, and especially in the last 150 years, researchers in the realm of spirit communication and spirit reality have been able to replicate situations, especially with seances and psychic mediumship, um, whereby this, this gulf could get smaller and smaller and smaller, and certain gifted individuals could um, find available the information and, in fact, the, the concrete reality of the spirit world without even any sense of a separation. And so these pioneers, um, to me, help to make the point that um, the separation is, is merely um, a, a, uh, an illusion, and it depends on one's mindset and one's ideology. And, you know, there is a, a distinction, of course. I mean, it goes without saying there's an important distinction between the kind of reality that we experience here on Earth and the kind of reality that we're going to experience um, after we make the transition. And so to say there's no veil, some could some could uh, argue that I'm just splitting hairs, but these hairs have their roots in our head, in our mind, and they set up um, a, a, an ideological um, um, a sort of a, um, it becomes an ossified or essentialist. It becomes essentialistic that there's this, this barrier. And, and that creates a little bit of an alienation and a little sense that, there, that there's something to be transcended that's very, very difficult to be transcended, when in fact, lots of times, it's extremely natural and straightforward to be transcended. And so you want to keep a more fluid um, posture toward the, the whole, um, the whole, the universe, the, the word universe means one uh, place. It means a oneness, a whole, a wholeness. Um, and so, you want to keep that in mind. I mean, it's it's not different from Eastern many Eastern um, traditions, but of course they don't really believe in spirits and the fact that we survive our death <clears throat> and our personality and our consciousness remains intact in the way we are familiar with it here. And that's what I've learned through reading lots of um, the history of spiritual the spiritualist movement is that in fact we are the same. People find themselves in this alternate physical realm it's not it still has physical reality for them the objects in the next realm are real they they feel solid um but then when they try to look back at our realm that our realm looks sort of um more illusory because it's a different vibration it's it's on a different level but it's it still takes up the same place you see a, a, an analogy for it if it's hard to picture for people is is um water vapor. Anywhere you, you are in the world, there are droplets of water, even though we can't see them. And in the desert, they're very, very few. And if you look up into a pure blue sky, there are water droplets up there, and they take up the same exact space as we take up. But then when clouds form, you realize, oh, that's been there all along, and now it's simply condensing and becoming more dense so that it becomes perceptible. And that's what spirits do. They become more dense. Right. It seems as though the materialistic 
world, the physical world we live in might have uh, maybe a lower frequency or density to it than what we sometimes refer to as the spiritual realm. Well, that's what the folks who report back from the other side, um, um, which I still think is part of the part of the world and not really other in a fundamental sense, but that's what they report is that when they try when they um, make the effort to come back into contact with us, they have to consciously intentionally lower their vibration, which is difficult. And they one of them described it as like um, trying to um, climb out of a of a swimming pool when you have an overcoat on. It just feels so heavy and it's so unnatural to them. They can do it though, which shows that there's no intrinsic, you know, in, in, uncrossable boundary. But um, but they they find it just extremely difficult to to get down. Some of them get good at it, and some of the spirit guides that many of the um, physical and mediums of of days gone by and currently with Stuart Alexander and some other um, contemporary physical mediums, they have these spirit guides that show up every time, sometimes materializing at, at some level of detail or other, sometimes vaguely and sometimes extremely solidly and um, fully materialize. And then they, they, their voice comes and they can, they can talk. And so the people on the other side, um, sometimes get very adept at returning to our level of vibration. Um, many of them find it difficult and they, they can't do it. A, a common complaint of those who have just crossed over is that all their loved ones are just ignoring them because they keep trying to talk to them and say, what are you doing looking at that sack of flesh? That's not me anymore. I'm here. You know, um, like in a deathbed situation, but the people can't hear them. Well, the the, the souls, the consciousness who are tran transitioning have to learn how to modulate their vibrational level, apparently, evidently, so that they can then be on the same wavelength as those of us who are still in this dense body. It's really, it's really fascinating. And so, I mean, and people think, well, if you can't see it, it's not, it's not matter. But don't forget, for example, wind. Wind can knock us over. We can't see it. Matter is anything that takes up space. And so the spirit world and spirits individually are not made of nothing. So they have to be made of something. And that something is in some measure to be thought of in terms of materiality. Uh, because like people see ghosts in groups people see ghosts all the people see the same ghost and describe it the same way as with my situation in when i was a a young man um and so they're not hallucinations um and they that ghosts will sometimes touch people push people they will rock in rocking chairs you know people see them uh, a certain haunted house will have the same old woman, for example, rocking in a rocking chair. So they're substantive. They're substantive. It's just a different kind of substance. And really, for for 5,000 years, the human race has known, though many of us have tried to suppress it or ignore or neglect the fact, we've known that there is this other sort of stuff because it's made incursions uh, into our reality frame. There's a larger reality frame that consists of um, or inheres in some sort of substance and it, it can come and, and be with us and, and influence and impact, make an impact on our, our, our experience. Um, just recently, a wonderful book came out by Irving Finkel called The First Ghosts. And Professor Finkel is a, a world leader in reading um, Babylonian cuneiform tablets. And he's produced this book that more than any other book before it has laid out the rich history of the first descriptions of spirits visiting, in this case, Babylon, and how to deal with them and the different kinds of spirits and the different sorts of manifestations that they make and how to even um, allow them to speak through a skull. There's a certain incantation a certain um, uh, protocol uh, uh, that allows you to hear them speak through a skull, which is very similar to voices that are produced in seances now 5,000 years later in some seances, like in the work of Alec Harris and D.D. And D. D. Hume, 
um, and and others, and Stuart Alexander, the voices can speak out of thin air. And importantly, Leslie Flint, who was a British medium for 61 years, who consistently had voices speaking out of thin air, even when uh, investigators would put tape over Leslie Flint's mouth or microphones on his throat to make sure that he wasn't throwing his voice in some way. No, these these voices, including repeat guides, like this this uh, young man, Mickey, who was killed in a car accident um, at the age of 12, he, for 61 years, would speak consistently. And he would speak to the group, make jokes, try to raise their vibrations and their enjoyment level and, and just kind of be a, a, a jester, a funny little kid. And he would also help help um, individuals in the sitting to connect with their loved ones. He would be sort of a uh, facilitator. And this is, they their explanation is that they're able to create through um, an amalgamation of their kind of material and our kind of material to create an actual um, simulation of the human voice box so that their thoughts could vibrate through it and actually affect the sound waves in, in the room, the seance room. And on YouTube, I, 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 I beseech our listeners, uh, our viewers to, to go and check out this. It's called the Leslie Flint Trust. And there are upwards of 150, um, recordings of full seances on that channel. And it's just, it's just amazing. And so he did this for 61 years, never was found to be in any sense, um, employing uh, trickery. And the fact that, that so consistently these voices could speak is further testimony in my mind that they're, that of, of the integration of the two kinds of matter. You know, it's not some foreign sort of matter or else there would not be able to be this nexus or this node that was created to allow voices to come through. 5,000 years ago, we were seeing ghosts. 2,000 years ago, Christ was seen to rematerialize three days after the crucifixion. And up until this afternoon, people have been seeing these, these spirits. We've always known that there's this other sort of stuff on the outside of our reality frame that comes in, but we haven't known what it is. And for, for centuries, there was this fantasy of this substance called ether. And people thought that there must be some substance, because even then they realized there had to be a substance because it wasn't a nothingness. So they thought it was ether. And up until a century ago, in the early part of the 1900s, scientists still thought, well, there must be ether there. But then um, certain experiments were performed, and it was shown without a doubt that there is no such thing. There's no, no, no detection was achieved of this substance. So then people thought, well, there is no such thing. There's only the material that we know of, the ordinary matter that we know of. And... Then, in 1978, which ironically was the same year that I was ha having this ghost conversation, this woman named Vera Rubin at Princeton realized that the rotation of galaxies, she was an astrophysicist, the rotation of galaxies and their coherence was such that it could not be explained gravitationally by the matter that we can see. And so she extrapolated that there must be some unseen type of matter that surrounds these gal galaxies in a halo. And she worked out the math of the rotation and the coherence of the spirals of the galaxies and realized that there has to be six times more of this type of matter than ordinary matter. Um, and since, since then, it's, it's been dubbed dark matter, which just means invisible matter. And so it ironically reinstates this old ether idea um, in a modern framework, a modern context. And so my proposal is that this dark matter, which we know almost nothing about except that it's much less dense than our matter and that it has a gravitational impact on matter at a macro level, I think it's a strong candidate for the spirit stuff that our, our re that human beings have been in perceiving all these many thousands of years. It's at least a strong candidate. It may not turn out to be the, the right one, but the fact that it's much less dense does accord with what spirits say is their realm. They say they go into a much less dense place, which from their perspective, 
there um, is as solid as our realm. But of course, our realm is not solid. You know, it's all uh, a matter of perspective. If you took an atom of your hand and blew the nucleus of that atom up to the size of an apple, the next closest such apple would be 1,500 miles away. That's how full of emptiness we are. And so it's just a, 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 like a matter of degree rather than a, ma- rather than a matter of kind. When people die, it's often reported that the, that the, uh, those in uh, the vigil, the deathbed vigil, will see um, a version of their same-looking body come up out of the, the now-dying body and st- st- uh, hover there, um, increasingly defined to look like their grandmother, and then sort of vanish. So this is, this is spirit stuff, whatever that spirit stuff turns out to be. And I think that when the spiritual phenomena take place, I think that these two kinds of substance simply are changing their ratio. There's a certain ordinary ratio, or uh, this room that I'm sitting in, and the room that all of you are, each of you is sitting in, is filled six times, with six times greater um, abundance with dark matter than with this matter. And I think that, that that's the usual order of things, but when, uh, when something spiritual is occurring, or paranormal in that sense, the ratio gets shifted. It's the same ingredients, it's just a different recipe now. And when somebody dies, I think that their, their, their body becomes fuller with ordinary matter and their, their invisible matter, etheric body or subtle body or energy body becomes visible now for the first time. And it is um, a mixture of a certain ratio between ordinary matter and this invisible matter. And so it's a, it's, it's a matter of, um, of, of shifting proportions of these two. It's not some completely different thing coming into a completely foreign environment. It's the, the same environment, but it's, it's, it's different recipes for different circumstances and different intentions. And I think that the, the, um, the reshuffling or, or remodulating of the, this ratio is driven by intention. In fact, the spirit stuff, dark matter or whatever it is, may very well be the very stuff of consciousness itself because a whole other realm that I try to tackle in the book is about how all information, all conscious information is available as we, as we know from remote viewing and um, precognition and psych- psychometry where we pick up an object and read its whole history. All information is imminently available just kind of at us and around us. And I think that's got to be related to the spirit matter. I think information and consciousness are, imbu- are what imbues this matter. When there's a haunted house, people talk about cold spots, you know, or they suddenly feel cold. And my friend and I certainly felt cold when we were talking to John Waite 44 years ago. And I think that what that is, is the spirit material or substance increasing its proportion to ordinary matter in the air. And therefore, the molecules of air are... are farther apart and it's like the uh, low pressure it's like the low pressure at altitude where people feel colder than at um, sea level because there's just less kinetic energy things are spread out so i think when people people experience a, a breeze of cold a, sort of a cold uh, zephyr coming in when there's a ghost present and i think this is I think this is the invisible matter actually, physically, concretely rushing in to fill up and spread out the ordinary matter. Um, and so, th- so cold spots are on one side of the coin. And then many of our viewers will know about apports, where an object will suddenly appear out of thin air 
It'll appear like a coin or um, a, a necklace or many other kinds of objects. And these are often said to be warm or hot to the touch initially when they appear. And I think that's because the ratio of ordinary matter to invisible matter is suddenly increasing where this thing becomes dense, where it was um, immaterial to our to our eyes a moment before and is suddenly material to our eyes and it's warm because the kinetic energy has just spiked because of this condensation, this sudden abrupt condensation. So I think that the cold, the reports of cold associations with spirit and this warm association um, are two sides of the same coin in terms of this hypothesis of the density and the lack of density being um, the same ingredients but different recipes. That's my little um, sort of uh, slogan uh, about about this. Yeah, it resonates that dark matter could be consciousness itself or certainly um, there could be different nuances in dark matter or invisible matter because certainly science has not seemed to be able to, they haven't been able to capture thoughts yet <laughs> fully. I know. I mean, remote viewers can can um, instantly go to a submarine hundreds of feet down below the surface of the ocean and they can read a book or they can uh, look at a number, a, a many digits number and report back and it turns out that is the same number. So there's, you know, Einstein and others of his era um, came to the idea that there may very well be no such thing as present and future and past. And also, though Einstein never agreed with this, there may not be something essential known as distance. Because, of course, quantum entanglement can allow for simultaneous um, actions light years apart with the, the paired particles. So that may be a clue for us, a little aperture into the underlying fact that the distance is an illusion just as time is an illusion. And so if this is the case, that may um, help to illuminate how remote viewers can instantaneously go, say, to Russia. Um, I mean, go to is a inaccurate way of putting it because everything is imminent. I mean, Russia is here as well as 8,000 miles away in this in this paradigm one of the uh qualities of a hologram is that the part contains the whole you know every every drop of the ocean contains the entire ocean in a sense and so i think that all information is here and it's also um in china and you know if we were sitting in a room in china we the, a a gifted remote viewer would be able to look in my sh look at my shirt before we before we um, post this video, obviously, and tell me what my shirt looked like because it's all right there. And this, you don't even have words. We don't have words for it because it's it's so beyond our everyday modes of conception. But it's been called the Akashic Record, of course, and and many people claim to be able to read the Akashic Record. Um, and the Akashic Record includes all of future and past, all the information that has ever been relevant to uh, consciousness, and down to the minutest uh, detail. Somebody, I forget who it was recently, was interviewed on one of um, another network. Um, <laughs> and she she's an Akashic re uh, record reader, and her friends keep saying, can you just hop on the, hop on the Akashic record and tell me where my wallet is? Because uh, I lost my wallet. And she usually says, no, it doesn't work that way. But one time she says, okay... All right, your wallet is here. And it was in an obscure place, like at the bottom of the clothes, dirty clothes hamper. And indeed, it was, it was there. Um, so it, it really is, it's from, it's from alpha to omega. Every kind of information seems to be available and accessible with the right stance and, and the right, um, tapping into, tapping into the uh, system. There's this larger consciousness system, as physicist Tom Campbell calls it, and it's just a matter of tapping into it. The The folks who were involved in the remote viewing um, projects at Stanford um, from the mid-70s to the early 90s, they could find a downed spy plane 
um, just by hearing that it was in Kenya, and they could they could zero in on it. And then as they as they advanced the um, methodology of of this um, remote viewing program at Stanford, the SRI, they could just be given an abstract um, what do you call this a ge- um, coordinates. Yeah, geographic coordinates, and they could just from that, just from such a a, um, a a meager, slim clue, they could view the place that those coordinates referred to, uh, the target. And then after after amazing themselves that they could do this, one of the uh, members, one of the investigators, kind of half jokingly said, "Well, why don't we just say target? <laughs> just the word target." When the investigators had a target in mind, but the reviewer shouldn't have it, and they just said, "Okay, target," and he would he would find the tar- he would accurately identify what was the attempted target. So it really is that we don't know. It's the system itself does the knowing for us, and if we it's, so for us, it's just a matter of tapping into it, and the system will provide. I mean, it's kind of like. God, and it may be the very same thing as God. You know, God will provide, the system will provide. If you know how to access the system or put in the keyword, um, it, like a, like an internet or like the cloud times infinity can offer up what we're asking for. You know, um, book, have you heard of book tests? These are where, um, a, uh, a medium can be, um, asked um, okay, there's a book on my shelf at my house, 25 miles from here. It's on the second shelf in my library, uh, and it's a red book. And then the, the medium, if, if she or he is a really good one, will, will say, all right, on page 84, there's the, the, there's a reference to, um, a seashell, you know, a spiral seashell. Any number of permutations of this, and of course they'll find that there is a reference. So it's every bit, every scintilla of information, no matter how um, trivial or minute, um, can be accessed if if you just have the right angle of approach or the the right sort of um, uh, consciousness setting. Well, people like Dean Radin have shown that our intention, as people who have been practicing magical arts for many years. Uh, he even looked at that a lot of those practices can really help a person with everything that you are describing, that intention, that focus, the attention, and really being able to connect with what we're wanting to receive information about, or as you are talking about, spirits we may want to connect with as well. Although there may be some people listening who are thinking, well, maybe there's a reason for this, quote, veil, or maybe it's serving some purpose at times as well. Yeah, a, a lot of people who have um, gone gone on through the transition known as death have said it's important that people on Earth forget the overarching um, sort of nature of the situation and forget that this earthly life is just a flash visit as D.D. Hume Hume called it Um, and it's a schoolhouse for us to for our souls to learn through the hard knocks of what it is here in this dense uh, plane and if we if we remembered our past home which really is what people who even near-death experiencers will say oh I felt like I was home and people who have transitioned and, and then, um, report back through, through mediums who have confirmed their ability through all sorts of tests. They'll report back and they'll say, yes, this is our home. Our earth visit is a schoolhouse, um, like a, a, a play, a dream, but we learn through it. And so it's important that we not have, um, fully present in our mind the, the whole overarching story of what, um, what our soul is going through and that there's love and acceptance waiting for us after we transition because um here we mostly don't think about that we have to focus on our um our path our journey here on on earth and and we it's better not to be distracted by knowing the the uh 
the the wide view you know the the long view of things we we need to go through in a in a sincere and and grounded and embodied way this this uh short story that we're in in life so it's important that we forget but there are so many it's been so fascinating to research uh, all of these remarkable mediums who both allow for physical manifestations that show this whole ratio of unseen uh, matter to ordinary matter being being um, uh, manipulated and get all sorts of information from um, um, deceased loved ones that they can pass on to the human race or to individuals who are mourning them. Most of you will have heard of Frederick Myers, who was a towering figure at the beginning of parapsychology study and, and founded the uh, Royal Society for Psychical Research in 1882. And he um, died young at 58 and then displayed a great desire to continue to communicate with um, mediums on Earth to prove the survival of the person. Um, and 30 years after his death, he communicated to Geraldine Cummins, who was a celebrated medium from the beginning of the 1900s for a while and was seen by many, many um, scientists and, and it was confirmed that she, she was able to do what she said she was able to do. Well, Frederick Myers communicated to her that the environment that the, uh, the, the passed on spirits lived in was like Earth environment, but in a much finer kind of of, um, of substance. And he said, it is, a, it is a structure so fine, it is invisible to the mortal eye and the finest instruments of the scientists. Ether is a bad term, but I cannot find another word to define it. This is a kind of air, or as I would like to say, a fluid or an emanation. It is the ancestor of matter as we know it. And I apologize for reading that, but I wanted to get it right, because what he's describing is at least what we know so far about dark matter is this invisible substance that is far finer than we can see in its, in its, in itself. When it mixes with ordinary matter, we can start to see it because it shapes ordinary matter. But, um, it is far finer than the scientific instruments can detect. And so far, we've only detected its gravitational influence. Scientists have found that dark matter is distributed throughout the universe, and by its, its gravitational effect, they're able to display, sort of graphically, this cosmic web of dark matter that suffuses the universe and connects it and guides the formation of galaxies, first suns and planets, and then it actually uh, allows for the organization through its gravity of the galaxies, of the stars into the galaxies, and then of galaxy clusters on a larger scale. Frederick Myers, back in 1932, saying that this kind of substance, his spirit substance that he now inhabits, is the ancestor of matter as we know it, kind of accords with what um, science is now finding about dark matter, about how it is the primordial organizing principle from the beginning of the universe. Um, and in fact, just last week, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope saw these early, early galaxies from between th five and eight um, hundred thousand years after the supposed Big Bang, and these galaxies are much more developed than we ever would have predicted. And so this is the action of dark matter at the beginning of the universe. And so its primordial nature is reflected in current scientific findings, and also by that Frederick Meyer statement. I found that pretty fascinating when I came across that statement. So this substance, this invisible substance, dark matter, ordinary matter, or a continuum of it, is swimming in us, and we are swimming in it. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. It pervades us, and it probably makes up the etheric or energy body that is animating us at, at the most um, fundamental level and that can briefly take a walkabout when people are able to have out-of-body experiences. Um, I think that's 
possibly exactly or plausibly exactly what what is happening. Um, and some people some people are able to manipulate this this ratio much better than others. There's there's a man in um, Argentina named Ariel Farias, whom a um, friend of the show, Stephen Browdy, philosopher Stephen Browdy, has gone and uh, directly investigated himself. And for 18 months, he was rigorously chronicled through like multiple cameras on him, uh, putting his hands lightly on a tabletop, a 32-pound table, and then it rises up. It doesn't come all the way off the ground, uh, as as furniture does for so many physical mediums back through history, as you find out when reading about them. But he, he can at least tip the table up with his fingertips. And no one understands how this is. My hunch, given what you've heard already about my thinking of these two types of matter interacting, is that he is able to infuse the table with more, uh, a higher ratio of invisible matter to ordinary matter than it usually has. And it becomes buoyant. It becomes lighter than air. It's not some sort of emanation from his fingers, like electromagnetic, that like actually lifts the table up. Um, Stephen Brody has experienced this table levitation both in the context of the Argentina man, Ariel, and in the context of another physical medium in Germany, Kai Muga. And he says that when the table comes up, it's very unlike when someone's lifting it. It's as though it's floating. It's though it's, it's floating like on waves. And this is exactly what buoyancy feels like. So I think my idea is that it gets infused. These objects get infused with more dark, more invisible matter, which is light and airy and much, much, much less dense than our matter. And although the volume doesn't change, because remember how much empty space there is from the atom and, and the hand and the apple, um, the volume of the table doesn't change. The appearance doesn't change, but it becomes lighter than air to some extent. I think I think this may, very well may be what's happening. And to connect with the earlier point about cold spots in a haunted house, Ariel Farias often feels that his hands and arms are cold when he's successfully doing this levitation. So I think that's because of the action of the air pressure um, being suddenly uh, plummeting, which causes people to be cold. I think that ghost hunters ought to be taking barometers or altimeters with them as part of their toolkit and find out that, I think they'd find out that these extremely inspirited spaces um, are also very, very low pressure compared to the ambient pressure of the rest of the house. You cite a woman in your book who also was engaging in table levitation and she was weighed, her body and the table were weighed and there was an actual... Uh, inverse proportion of weight between her and the table uh, in that process. That was absolutely fascinating. William Crawford in the 1920, 19-teens and then published in 1921 um, had this medium that he worked with named Kathleen Gulliger, who was a young woman, 17 only, when he was began working with her. And she had, like Ariel Farias in Argentina today, she had the ability to cause or facilitate ta uh, tables actually levitating off the ground, becoming lighter than air. And he was the first, William Crawford was the first, he was a physical engineer. He was able to take scales to both the medium and to the table, very accurate spring, spring-loaded scales. And he found that, as you say, when the table would get lighter, she would become heavier by just about the exact same degree. And she could also request that the table become heavier. And so the, the scale, like if the table was ordinarily 22 pounds, the scale would now read 28 pounds, and her scale would, would um, show her to be 6 pounds less than her, her usual weight. So this to me implies that there's, there's a sort of a, a dance, a, um, a reciprocal flow of this these two kinds of matter into between the uh, the body of the facilitator and the um, substance of the object that's being levitated or made denser. So I think that when it's denser, some of the invisible matter gets gets wicked out of it um, and is in the body then of the of of the uh, host, um, the uh, facilitator, 
and vice versa. So this kind of does to me sort of run along the same lines as my, as my hypothesis about the, the two kinds of matter um, collaborating with each other. It's, it's, it's a collaboration of the two kinds of matter as, um, as conducted, like a conductor, a musical conductor, as conducted by the consciousness of the, uh, of the uh, medium. The conscious intention can influence this. And I think if, if the invisible matter um, is in fact this, the very stuff of consciousness. It makes sense that it's responsive to the consciousness that an individual can apply to it. You know that it's that it's immediately and um, intensively r- responsive to it. So that these folks, these gifted folks, can um, change the ratio, change the recipe uh, relatively immediately. I mean, it takes it takes Ariel Furias sometimes a couple minutes of concentration before the table before he feels cold, and then the table begins to rise. So it's not always immediate, but he and many others are able to conduct this symphony of interaction uh, between these two fundamental kinds of um, material. It seems as though they may be merging with this uh, perceived solid object. It's funny you should say that because he actually um, reports that he feels himself merging. He feels that his hands are merging with the table, but they're not they're not objectively merging because he's he he moves his hand. Some people say, "Oh yeah, well his hands must have some sticky substance on them and he's like subtly lifting the table. The uh, YouTube channel is is just Juan Jimeno, G I M E N O, and if you look up that and um Ariel Farias, you'll find clips of him doing this and it's it's amazing. And you know, I think he's changing the actual substance of the table. And, and this brings me to one one other point on this on this um, ratio and recipe uh, train of thought. In 2010, a, a researcher named Barry Colvin published uh, an analysis of spirit knocks or raps. They often back in the day they were called spirit raps, where very frequently, commonly, um, people in haunted situations or seances will hear raps on a table or on the, the wall. And Barry Colvin was able to analyze um, 20 different recordings of these raps from 20 different sites and different situations of poltergeists and other uh, hauntings. And the, um, the spectrogram um, was identically different in all of these spirit situations, spirit um, percussions, than they are when we knock on a on a table. When we knock on a table, say, or any object, the the highest energy is at the beginning, and then it trails off. In these spirit percussions, it it builds up for the first um, few split seconds, and then we have the highest energy. So what he was able to deduce from that is that. Um, there's a pressure change within the substance, within the molecular structure of the wood of the table that builds, it builds um, up progressively. And then the high, the peak of energy on, on the, uh, the, the spectrogram is uh, achieved when the pressure is at its highest. So it's, it's altering even, even knocks are not just on the surface of the object, but they're within the object. They're, they're um, a, a, a function of changing the object's interior material. And so that, to me, is similar to my idea of how those who can levitate objects are changing them within themselves, not applying something externally that raises them. There's a metaphor that you use in your book of water being blue that helps illustrate this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like people will try to explain the relationship between spirit reality and ordinary re- reality uh, and they'll use metaphors like the veil um and like interpenetration um that still maintain sort of more separation more otherness and distance than i i feel is is uh, the the right way to think of it so i think like if you were to put a a, a drop or several drops of blue dye into clear water, 
you wouldn't say that the blue dye interpenetrates the water. You would say that the water is now blue. The water is blue. And I think that the way I'm, I've come to see the situation of spirit and ordinary matter is that our water is blue. Um, our air is infused with spirit air. Um, and it's not, it's mixed. Our reality is blue water in that sense, is that the spirit substance and ordinary substance are not somehow figuring out a way to, to um, blend with each other or to um, become compatible with one each other, with each other. They're already pre-compatible from the beginning of time. They're, they're um, n natural mates. The, the water being spirit and the blue dye being ordinary matter? They could be either way around. It's just that the water is blue. They're not two different things. They're one thing. But they can change their, they can, they can dance into a different, um, sort of relationship or performance within this one thing. They can, they can change their, their, um, their relative, um, weights or levels of, of, um, of manifestation. And so you could say that when there's, when, that normally every day, every day reality, the water is, uh, our water is a certain shade of blue. And that when there's a haunted house and let's say a cold room, the water is deeper blue. Um, and in a seance, the water is uh, another shade of blue. And that if you think of, of the, the, the blue as being the spirit matter, then it's, um, it's concentration. Um, will, would then be metaphorically a, 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 a richer shade of blue. What you're sharing also suggests that everything is happening and everything just is. It's very Zen in that sense. Where I'm taking my own steps, I think, is, is just to try to integrate the, um, the phenomenology of spirits interacting with with uh, dense spirits are living so I don't want to say interacting with living people we're all living but uh, the the, the uh, light the uh, less dense folks interacting with the more dense folks I think is what I'm trying to um, bring into this idea of the oneness of the universe because I certainly have nothing new to say about the oneness of the universe as such yeah. And this is a concept of eternalism. Yeah. And the block universe. That's a whole other thing. The block universe is that there is no privileged present moment. Um, what's a present moment for me may be seen as a future moment for somebody at a different rate of speed at a different distance from me. Um, and it seen as a past moment for, for somebody else on the other side in a different tra trajectory. It's hard to describe. I mean, I try my best to sort of lay this out in the book, but it's hard. It's, it's very, you know, it's Einstein, so it's not that easy to, to just um, explain. But suffice it to say that there's no privileged um, present moment. He, he said there's, there's uh, no hitching post in the universe. You can't hitch truth um, or interpretation of time or space to one, any one moment. Everything is in flux and everything is personal. It's perspectival. So, yeah. you know, so there is no, as you say, no absolute, you know, today and tomorrow and the next day. Everything is, um, everything is viewable as future or past. So, so the idea of the block universe is that everything has already happened and it's all contained in a block of space-time. And that doesn't mean that we're all frozen. We're still going through our um, life history, but that too is accounted for in the ultimate, from the God's eye perspective, the external perspective of physics, or perhaps God himself or herself, accounted for in this cube of, of um, all of history and, and space. And um <clears throat> so that too kind of sort of um runs into the whole rest of this effort to understand what's going on with with uh 
with life because once people die, they report there is no time. You know, time is just a construct that we have to live by here in this, in this blinded type of, of, uh, of drama that we're each living here on earth. But that once we transition, we come to realize that there's just a, an expansive present moment. And we unfold and continue to grow and learn in this expansive present moment. But it doesn't have to do with time as we understand it. Chris, is there anything else you want to share today about the concept that there is no veil? These researchers of yesteryear, and some still today, although the materialistic um, paradigm is, does its best to sideline these, these researchers, as, as viewers of this channel will very well understand, these folks are on the, on the, the very um, frontier of unlocking what is the truth. It's, it's actually the, the truth. Uh, Leslie Flint, for 61 years, talked to the dead from midair, and they told uh, what, what the um, cosmology of reality and of love and of the soul's progress um, up, up the different levels of, of growth and understanding and knowledge and, 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 and love and compassion, what this all means. And I think it's, I think it's uh, literally the truth. The people who die who are um, Christians or, or believers in a fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible find themselves very disappointed because there's no external punishment. There is only internally recognized, say, remorse for things that we um, didn't do as lovingly as we should have while on earth. And we learn from them. I mean, it's, it's often said that this earthly life is a schoolhouse, not a courthouse, or a schoolroom, not a, not a courtroom. So there's no damnation. There's no um, punitive judgment that goes on after we pass from this level. There's only further learning and a, a sort of a consolidation of what we manage to learn and grow into while, while living on earth and then a, a taking of that forward. And so I, I wish that, you know, think how many sectarian um, wars and scourges of, of earthly judgment and punishment um, meted out by authoritarians would, would be vaporized, so to speak, uh, if, if, if we could all come to understand this. But, you know, I understand that that's just an idealized, romanticized view of what, what could be. Another reason that spirit stuff and earthly substance are not separated essentially by some veil or barrier is so simple. It's sort of right under our nose, but we can tend to let it slip our minds when we're pondering the issue on a grand scale. And that's that we, each of us, are composed of both spirit substance and earthly substance. Um, the two occupy the exact same space right here. Chris, thank you so much for sharing this heartfelt, thought-provoking information. Thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, it's been my privilege. I really, really, really en enjoyed it. And um, thank you. I I'm just a beginner in this whole field, and I hope to continue learning in the years I have left here. Well, we're all learning alongside each other. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website.